All right, welcome back to Radio Wasteland, and our guest tonight is Richard Estep. Uh, we're going to be talking about his new book, uh, The Horrors of Fox Hollow Farm, Unraveling the History and Hauntings of a Serial Killer's Home. You know, uh, this book title really is kind of covering everything that we're interested in, serial killers, paranormal, yeah. and everything, but Fox Hollow Farm was, uh, I was talking to my wife about this, and she's kind of the true crime um, fiend, and she hadn't heard of this one, so I, I think we should probably start off with talking about what actually happened at Fox Hollow Farm, what the initial event was that sort of kicked all this off. Absolutely. <clears throat> well, it surprises me that Herb Baumeister, the I-70 Strangler, is one of those serial killers that most people have never heard of. You know, uh, everyone knows Gacy, Dahmer, Bundy, people of that nature, but not Herb Baumeister. So the story is that Herb Baumeister was a married man, a family man, uh, in Indiana. And he and his wife owned a chain of uh, thrift stores, you know, discount stores, uh, and made a pretty decent, prosperous living, enough so that they could afford to buy this 17-and-a-half-acre property called Fox Hollow Farm out in uh, Carmel, um, which is, you know, a, a rural part about 20, 30 minutes away from um, Indianapolis. So to all intents and purposes, you have the perfect American family here, you know, clean cut, fresh living, um, boy, girl, that kind of thing. But beneath the surface, her Baumeister was something very different. Um, when his wife, Julie, would go uh, take the kids to the lake for the weekend, Herb would hit the gay bars of Indianapolis. And uh, he was well known there under the, the pseudonym Brian Smart. And he would look for a very specific type of man, preferably a younger one, uh, anywhere between uh, the late teens through the early to mid thirties at the oldest and, and hopefully one that would not be missed because this is the mid early to mid nineties, you know? So um, there was a huge stigma to, to being a, a gay male or female in those days. And when people of, of that kind of nature disappeared, often too many questions weren't asked, right. you know, it and, seemed to be a common MO of the time. Well, and, and, and yeah, very much so. And, and people just brushed it off when these guys would disappear. It was said, you know, oh, maybe they just moved on. They went to San Francisco. Or the most awful thing I heard uh, was, you know, people would brush it off and say, oh, maybe they died of AIDS. Oh, right. With, without actually, you know, looking into this too much. So Herb Baumeister was always looking for these men that would not be missed. Preferably no family, no loved ones, nobody to miss them. And what he would do, Fox Hollow Farm is unique. It's this mock Tudor farmhouse, large, large house, and has a basement with a swimming pool in it, which I've, I've never really seen in another house. Mm. And so what he would do before he would go out uh, of a weekend, he would crank up the heat on the pool to maximum temperature and put the pool cover across. So, you know, just like when you put a saucepan of hot water simmering on your range. Uh, and then he would go out and hit the town. He would find a young man and say, hey, my name is Brian, Brian Smart, and, and I'm working in construction, and I'm working on this great old house about you know, a short drive from here, and they've got a pool. So how would you like to come back, have a few drinks, and party? And you know, it wasn't a hard sell to yeah. some of these guys. So um, he, he would take them back to Fox Hollow Farm and uh, take them downstairs, and the pool room has these large French doors, which he would open up and let in the cool night air, and he would roll back the pool cover. So you get this very hot air rising from the pool, this influx of cold night air, and what does that give you? Steam. Steam, yeah. So this makes it a very disorienting environment. Um, and to make this even weirder, Herb had put a whole bunch of mannequins, like shop, um, you know, storefront window mannequins, all dressed for a beach party. He put them all around the pool, uh, and in the, the wet bar next door, as if there was a party going on. And so he would get the, uh, the young man into the pool, and he would ply them with drink and drugs. Um, there's the party that he promised them, and he would tell them that he knew a really cool trick. And he used to invite them to loop a length of the pool hose around his neck and, and slowly squeeze it as they would masturbate one another. Uh, and Herb said, this, this, this feels amazing, you know. Uh, we're talking about autoerotic asphyxiation. And then he would say, it's my turn. So, so, so here we go. And he would suffocate, strangle, I'm sorry, uh, his victim to death. And it's not known 
there, there are some theories. It's not known whether he set out to do that the first time and accidentally killed someone, found out that he liked it. I don't think that's the case, and I'll talk about why that is in, in a short while. But he would, he would kill them, strangle them to death, and then he would um, do whatever he chose uh, with the corpse before dragging it out into the woods behind Fox Hollow Farm. And one of the stranger things about the murders, Fox Hollow was surrounded by very thick woods, and it is today, but it was much more isolated then because now there are houses relatively close on either side. But back then, you moved out onto the back deck and you saw nothing but trees. Um, and so he would drag the bodies out there and he would burn them, mulch them, cut them up, but what he never did was bury them. So those bodies were left to decompose, partially burned in some cases, um, in the woods behind Fox Hollow Farm. And he got away with this for years. It's believed that as many as 19 young men could have died at Fox Hollow. Um, so many of the, of the bones that were found were damaged, whether uh, beaten, that it was impossible to, to, to trace how many. But the number, um, the number of victims at Fox Hollow, for sure, is at least 10, possibly as many as 19. Man, that is just crazy. So you said after he... <sighs> well, I guess I got a couple questions here. So the first, the first one is, <coughs> do we know if his MO evolved? In the case of a lot of serial killers... Um, it sort of evolved over time, but I guess you suggested that maybe the first time was an accident and he discovered that he liked it. So that might be the case there. So, so as far as we know, this is the only way he killed people. But, you know, you'll notice that I, I told you that his nickname was the I-70 Strangler, not the right. Fox Hollow Strangler. Right. The reason for that is this. Whenever a serial killer is caught, as I'm sure you know and I'm sure your, your viewers know, the police start looking through their files for unsolved murders in the vicinity, ones that fit the MO. It turns out that nine or ten young men were found killed along the interstate corridor in the area, always on weekends that Herb Baumeister was away on a business trip driving. And they were found strangled, dumped by the side of the road or in some trees in a state of undress, often with their pants around their ankles. Mm. And so... Because of the fact that the, the murders coincided with Herb's trips, um, something else that the police noticed, the murders stopped at the same time the Baumeisters bought Fox Hollow Farm. I see. Uh, so it, they is that how they caught him eventually? Or? No, here's, here's how they caught him. Um, so, so you said you're, um, it's Chauncey, is it? Yes, Chauncey. Chauncey so you, yeah. you, you said you're married, you have a, have a wife. Yes. So if you, if, you, if you happen to be acting strangely, you know, I don't know what your wife would think, but it's pretty reasonable to assume she's not going to go, I do wonder if Chauncey is, is bringing men home and murdering them and putting them in the backyard. <laughs> like nobody, nobody really starts out. It's not what you jump to first. Yeah. Right. I put exactly. the pickle jar on the wrong shelf and she calls yeah. me. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's so, you no know, getting It's a monster. <laughs> it's, it's easy to see how this kind of escaped his wife's attention. The first real clue was uh, when Herb's son is playing out in the woods behind Fox Hollow and he finds oh, a human God. skull. Yeah. Mm. So now bear in mind, he's got a sister and any That's boy funny. with a sister finds a skull and this is a golden opportunity, right? So he Absolutely. goes to the house, gets a big broom handle, puts the skull on the stick and puts it up to a bedroom window. Cue screaming, cue pandemonium, cue hilarity for him. Uh, and so mom, of course, wants to know, where did you find this thing? So he leads her out into the woods, and Herb's wife sees bones. She sees lots of bones, and they look human. So rather than call the police, she confronts Herb when he comes home from work that day, and he's very dismissive. He's like, oh, don't worry about it. Dad, who was a doctor, Herb said, that's dad's medical school skeleton. You know, I, I threw that out into the woods. I'm sorry. I'll go get rid of it. Um, the, the critters must have gotten, gotten into it. And she accepted this, um, this explanation. <laughs> yeah, it's a little improbable. But... Well, I mean, you know, who knows, right? Again, I mean, it, it's it. probably more probable than my husband has murdered 19 people, yeah. I guess. Who so. wants <laughs> to believe that they're living with a serial yeah. killer? Really and what bad. year was this? I'm sorry. What year so was this? So this? this is the mid-90s now. Right. Okay. Um, so, so I guess it's possible that that a, a 
his dad's school skeleton could have actually been a real skeleton at that year. It's theoretically possible, absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. and, and I totally see why she wouldn't necessarily open that whole can of worms, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so anyway, the Baumeister's marriage was kind of troubled. In fact, they were on the <laughs> outs. Um, is, it, what really got Herb nailed was he got careless, right? And this is the thing with almost all serial killers. They get away with it and they get away with it and they get away with it until the moment they don't. And in Herb's case, he picked the wrong guy. Um, he picked a young man who had family that missed him and hired a private detective. And a lot mm. of the credit for, um, for breaking the case goes to this man, a chap called Virgil Vandegrift, um, who, who knew how law enforcement worked. And as he started poking around, um, Herb, uh, excuse me, Virgil went to the same bars. He posted, have you seen this man? Posters of the victims and um, started asking questions and stories started to emerge of this guy, this Brian Smart, um, that was the last seen in, uh, in the company of the men that had disappeared. And it wasn't long before Mr. Vanegar started to suspect that a serial killer was working the gay bars of Indianapolis. So that alone caused, the, the police did stake out the bars, they did listen to him, but Herb killed intermittently, so they weren't able to catch him in the act. Nobody saw him doing it. Finally, though, he let the victim live. Uh -huh. And uh, this, this victim went by the, the pseudonym of Tony Harris, um, and he managed to escape from Fox Hollow Farm, went to the police, told them that he'd been essentially attacked by this individual in a big old place, something, something farm. It had a big wooden sign outside, but I don't remember exactly what or where. Mm -hmm. um, so finally, things started to, to, to point towards somebody very affluent that lived not too far from Indianapolis. And they ended up finally tracing Herb's car. They got a picture of this Brian Smart when he reappeared. They got a picture of his car license plate, traced it through the vehicle records, and found that it was registered to one Herbert Baumeister of Fox Hollow Farm. So now the detectives have him. They have their man, but they can't prove it. He lawyers up. He refuses to allow a search of his property. Yet, amazingly, he doesn't clean up the property. Um, <laughs> yeah. And finally, finally the cops get to Fox Hollow Farm and when Herb is out and his wife allows them access. And he goes out into the woods behind the farm, the cops go into the woods behind the farm, and they find not just hundreds but thousands of bones and bone fragments. It's a boneyard going all the way out into the woods. So it's obvious that, that this is, you know, these are multiple men. I mean, some of, the, some of the arms are handcuffed. You know, they show signs of trauma, of having been burned, of having been, been hacked up. So they're going to go arrest Herb, but when he hears of this, he gets tipped off. Herb makes a run for the border. He goes to Canada, crosses the border. Um, he's napping. This is kind of interesting. He's napping under a bridge in his car, and uh, somebody's knocking on his window. And he wakes up, and it's a Canadian mounted officer. And the mounted officer tells him, sir, you can't sleep here. It's not safe. So he drives away. He said, I'm, I'm on a vacation, just taking a safety nap. He drives away. On the back seat of his car was a box full of videotapes, old VHS tapes, which have never, ever shown up since. We don't know what happened to them. But Herb went to a uh, beach in a uh, state park near a lake, uh, pulled out his dad's gun, which was a 357 Magnum that he'd nicknamed Dirty Harry. Uh, and he ate his favorite food in the world, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and then shot himself in the head uh, after writing a suicide note. Now, the suicide note took no responsibility for any murders, never mentioned any murders. He basically said that he, his business was failing, you know, and uh, he had not been a great uh, family man after all. He was kind of a failure. Um, and he was now going to lay down and go to sleep, is how he put it and he shot himself in the head. Um, at no point, though, did he ever allude to what he'd done to those poor men. Man, that is just wild. Wow. I, I can't believe that I haven't That's heard of story. this. <laughs> you no, know, I, I'm a horror movie fanatic. I'm, I'm all about the horror films. My wife, in contrast to me, she's all about the real, real murders. And, uh, and so I've watched a lot of shows, watched a lot of stuff with her, and I have never heard of this one, you know? Um, well, you know, this gets crazier because if you think about it, right, um, Herb Baumeister, if he'd actually stood his ground, if he'd been brazen enough, and he was a brazen man, um, if he had actually denied all knowledge and had said, I have no idea how all these bones turned up in my backyard, 
he might actually have gotten away with it. He was never charged. No one was ever convicted of those murders. Even today, he is a alleged serial killer because he was never brought to trial. But right. um, the thing is that when you bury the body of a victim, there's a degree of preservation. So when it comes to the forensic side of things, it helps preserve the evidence. When you leave them out in the wind, rain, and snow for years, they kind of get scoured and sandblasted, you know? Oh, right. So there right. may have been no DNA evidence at all to tie her Baumeister to, um, to those remains at all. He could possibly have gotten away with it. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you said that he didn't clean up at all because um, my wife and I, you know, you said, would your wife notice? You know, we've actually mm -hmm. joked about how there's no way that I'm a serial killer because like she'd come home from from her trip and be all, uh, Chauncey, why is there a huge pile of blood on the kitchen floor? And I'd be all, oh yeah, I meant to clean that up. You know, because mm -hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have gotten it's around. It's been there for like a week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, well, You're ever going to clean that viscera off the ceiling? It's like, right. I'm, I'm wondering if okay, he wait. left the bones out there as part of his, you know, as part of his um, fetish, you know, that somehow helped tide him over because you said that he killed intermittently. I'm wondering if those bones were part of the fetish. I guess we don't know that, though. He, he certainly got off on, on, on hiding in plain sight. And, um, I don't know if you have the ability to, to incorporate a YouTube video into the show. I do, yeah. You should absolutely do this. I want you to actually see it um, because this is one of the most chilling things that I think you'll see in a long time. The Indiana Department of Transportation maintains over 11,000 miles of roadway and we paint those miles of roadway each year and this is just an isolated incident that happened. The drive by striping, <laughs> you know, whatever. Herb Baumeister of Carmel saw it all. I said to my son, they're going to hit that raccoon with a spray gun, and sure enough, they just striped right over its face and neck. You know, didn't even move it, you know, no effort to, you know, get it out of the way. So I happened to have a Polaroid with me, so I took a shot at the thing. A raccoon, which met its demise on the yellow line, became one with the paint. The raccoon has since been removed. This is all that's left. This was just, you know, uh, the painter should have had a chalk line drawn around his career by state officials. There was no excuse for that. I mean, the poor thing deserved a better fate than that. Yeah, so I'm back. Okay. okay. So, <laughs> no, number one, Herb looks like everybody's, he looks like a bank manager, right? Right. He, he looks so ordinary, like the neighbor you could have and, and never be suspicious of. Well, it took me a second. I kind of thought he was the news reporter. It took me a second right. to really understand right. what I was looking at. Yeah. So where he was standing on the fence behind him, <laughs> that fence is the property fence, the property line for Fox Hollow Farm. Okay. Mm. Um, so a few hundred feet behind Herb and slightly off to one side, the bodies of how many but double digits victims that he put there are decomposing and he's getting angry about a <laughs> raccoon that got spray painted over. Right. Can you that believe the so front crazy. of this guy? Yeah. Right. Because so, his concern was like about a job well done. It wasn't really, yeah, about, how, it wasn't really was about that animal. How dare they though? This poor raccoon deserves so much better. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's what he says. And you've got the bodies of his victims yeah, festering. Yeah. So the, that's the only that I'm aware of anyway, um, a video footage of Herb, and it was to complain about the body of a raccoon being treated disrespectfully. Imagine the, the kind of mindset of a man that can do that knowing what's behind him. And I talked to the victim that escaped. Um, he was kind enough to come back to Fox Hollow, uh, and actually we interviewed him for the book, and he said based on his experience of Herb, um, he thought that her very much enjoyed the, the gloating the aspect of, you know, you guys have no idea what's going on. Watch this hand, but you have no idea what the other hand is doing. Mm -hmm. But he actually got off on pulling a fast one on all the viewers that he would, you know, would get on his side from that footage. If you don't know what that, who that man is in the video, it's the dullest piece of footage on YouTube, right? But right, once yeah. you know the backstory, it's horrific. Yeah, well, it makes yeah. sense that he sort of, because when you were first telling the situation with the pool and the mannequins, it led me to believe that he wanted an audience but knew it wasn't an option. Yeah, and I was told that um, Herb used to refer to himself in the third person and that he'd come up with a backstory for most of these mannequins. They all had names, uh, you know, and uh, 
and according to uh, according to uh, his his so called the victim that got away, um, he actually said the owner Herb spoke of himself in the third person, and he said the owner of Fox Hollow Farm does not like to be alone. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that is just just absolutely freaky. You know, it's it's really just weird to me that that these things even exist. Um, this might not be a question you're able to answer, but are serial killers, because during that time through the 70s, through the 90s, we were really trying to, as a society, catch these guys, understand these guys. Has, has instances of serial killers per capita gone down or has that really changed at all? I mean, well, serial killers, have, killers, I've just written a book about them for Visible Ink Press, which is out next year. Uh, the biggest book I've ever written, 150,000 words on serial killers. So I spent is that a the year, uh, On Dark Ground? No, no, no. No, no this, this book is, is, uh, is not going to be released for another year. Okay. But um, I spent a year delving into this subject and, and looking at countless serial killers. They've always been with us, but one of the things that, uh, that I think has fueled the explosive growth is the media fascination with them, right. you know? I mean, y you look at killers like Ted Bundy that had groupies, that mm. had a genuine following, you know? Uh, and you look at the serial killers that are on death row, like Richard Ramirez, responsible for the most heinous rapes and murders, getting fan mail from people. So. Right. Society I had a friend in high school who wrote back and forth with uh, Charles Manson. Uh-huh. Yeah. We, we, we have this perennial fascination with the serial killer, and I think that has led to, to more of them um, uh, operating. I really, really do. Serial killers only recently have become, and I hate to use this word, cool. Right. You know? Because they're not. They're vile human beings. Cool. But... Right. Um, that there, unfortunately, you know, how many true crime documentaries are there? How many books have been written? How many films have been made? Because people are fascinated with what they do. And some of them attain almost rock star status. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, everybody talks about soccer moms. I mean, my wife's an ID channel mom. And there's a lot of them out there, you know. Uh, she just loves the ID channel. She'll basically sit on her tablet and play Animal Crossing and run the ID channel in the background. She loves it. Yeah, and so what's what's kind of interesting would be that if if his victim had not escaped, Herb may probably may well have just kept on killing and would probably have gotten away with it. They found Fox Hollow Farm after searching, um, driving the back roads of rural Indiana, looking for something something farm with a big wooden sign. And of course, this was long before Google Maps, Google Earth, anything like that. Right. You just drove, right, and you covered hundreds and hundreds of miles of of highway until they finally caught a break and managed to track down this farm. So um, he could have gone on killing and killing and killing um, for many more years if he hadn't slipped up and let one of his victims live. You know, the serial killer that makes me think the most about what you were saying before about sort of the, the uh, coolness and the stardom of it is I forget his name, but he was the guy who was posting videos on YouTube of him killing cats. I guess he wasn't a serial killer, but he ended up murdering, and they had to. He left a bunch of clues that were movie quotes, and uh, mm -hmm. he would kill kittens online. And he was just all about the fame of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're right. I I can see that happening. You know, another statistic that's been blowing my mind here lately is that this month shootings in New York City are up like. 40% from last month. I mean, this exact time last year. And of course, here we are in COVID, people aren't going out, but apparently they still have time to shoot each other at a higher rate, you know? So it's like, you know, the stresses of the world and uh, mm -hmm. the media of the world and stuff, you know, really might be an influence on people. You know, we've, oh, yeah. always, we've always said like, oh, video games don't make people kill. Maybe they do. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they do. Karen, my, I think my, my belief, uh, and I'm, I'm working as a paramedic, so, um, my belief is that those kind of influences make you more of what you already are. So if you have some degree of derangement, if you have an inability to, to either tell or care about the line between reality and fantasy, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that there's a, an influential factor there. I mean, um, I've gunned down thousands of people on Call of Duty, but I would never dream <laughs> of doing it in real life. But not everybody sees that distinction, do they? 
Yeah, well, they definitely don't. I mean, listeners of this show have heard me complain before that as a as a horror movie fan, I have a hard time finding other friends that are fans of horror films because most of them take it a little too seriously. I like horror films like a roller coaster. You know, I want it to be over. I want to get off and talk about how cool it was. You know, it's not something that, you know, I don't have the look. I'm not like dressing up like a whore. I, I don't know. It's like it, they take it a little too far and I, I have a hard time connecting with it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Well, my, my thought on that is I, I don't I don't see the person that goes to, say, a horror convention and mm. dresses as Michael Myers to be any different than the person that spends the same amount of cash on a Denver Broncos sweatshirt, you know? Yeah, um, I didn't I didn't necessarily mean dresses like it, but I meant tries to model my day-to-day life after yeah, the, after the actions of it, mm. you know, the darkness and trying to be mm-hmm. the mysterious person, you know, doing the cosplay. I mean, hell yeah, that's fun. I'd do it too, you know, but. Yeah, I think it comes down to, again, knowing where that line's drawn, right? I like a good horror movie, too, but the whole point of a horror movie is you're scared safely and you know the roller right. coaster's going to end and you're going to step off and you're going to be fine. Yeah. And of course, horror movies are rehearsals for death. They get us used to mortality. Right. All right. Well, I am loving this topic. Uh, you're listening to uh, Richard Estep here on Radio Wasteland. We're talking about his book, The Horrors of Fox Hollow Farm, the unraveling of the history and hauntings of a serial killer's home. But that was just the first half. When we yeah, come back, only the beginning talk of this about story. the paranormal aspects that had followed the initial murders. So uh, come on back. All right, welcome back to Radio Wasteland and our guest, Richard Estep. We're talking about his book, The Horrors of Fox Hollow Farm, Unraveling the History and Hauntings of a Serial Killer's Home. Um, you know, when I first heard the title of it, as soon as I read Fox Hollow, I'm just all, oh, that's pretty Lovecrafty, and I like that. It, you know, it makes me think of a uh, Witch's Hollow, and um, which was actually August Derelith after Lovecraft's death, but Lovecraft's credited. And uh, But um, Fox Hollow, it's just like, you know, you see a place called Fox Hollow and you're all like, oh, I know something shady went on there. So it's a perfect thing <laughs> to carry on a legacy. Um, you know, so so we in the last segment, we covered the murders that went on there spanning years. And so since then, the house has a new history that's going along with it that it just can't shake this, right? Well, something that's very unique about Fox Hollow Farm is that most locations of serial murders are demolished once it comes to light what took place there. And and I think rightfully so, you know, you don't want them becoming a shrine to to the wrong sort of people. Mm -hmm. Um, But Fox Hollow was, was left on the market. Uh, Herb Baumeister's wife and children moved out quite understandably. They wanted to step out of the shadow of that place and the events. And, you know, she she changed their name and, and they started their life over. Um, and the house was infested with, just ironically enough, raccoons um, for, for a long time. And then it was finally purchased by a couple called Rob and Vicky Graves. Um, no pun intended. That that truly, his, his name truly is Rob Graves. And Rob is is an expert on the Herb Baumeister murders. Um, in addition to being a coroner, um, Rob lives in Herb Baumeister's house, sleeps in his bedroom, you know, bathes in his bath, and um, w- was intrigued by everything that happened at Fox Hollow. Initially, though, because they're what they like to call horse people, they were just looking for somewhere where they could race horses, you know? And uh, Fox Hollow was not only this huge 17 and a half, 18 acre uh, ranch, essentially, but it was going at quite a discount. And it was only when they did a, a viewing of the place, they turned up to, to, to walk around, and they realized they recognized it from the newsreels, and um, the realtor had to disclose, yeah, hey, uh, a number of murders uh, believed to have taken place at Fox Hollow and the bodies were found in the woods. And the so realtor they didn't them, tell them until they brought it up? Well, I mean, you do have to disclose that. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were told. <laughs> Just, you know, it's that old thing, right? If something looks too good to be true, it usually is. Yeah. Right. So you, well, there were a few uh, murders. Yeah, right? <laughs> you don't get a house this size, an estate this size, at a discount without something being amiss. 
Yeah, and totally. I mean, this guy was a coroner whose last name was Graves, so he had to expect some sort of uh, serendipitousness yeah. to go on in his life beyond that. <laughs> but, you know, in history of murders, it could have been dry rot, so yeah. maybe right. they got off easy. As, it's <laughs> not asbestos. This is a little more serious. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but, but Rob wrote the section of the book on, on Herb Baumeister himself. He studied the man intensely. Um, and so, you know, I, I'd heard about this place and heard it was – heard it was supposedly haunted. The, as, as the story was told to me, Rob and Vicky were both very skeptical. They don't believe in ghosts or they didn't believe in, in, in that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, they knew there was a bit of a macabre history at their new home, but they said they could live with it. And, and pretty much they had no issue. They moved in and finally brought in um, a friend of theirs, a young guy called Joe LeBlanc, uh, to be a lodger. Um, because they had a bunch of spare space and, you know, it would, uh, would help to have a little extra money coming in. And that's when things started to get really strange. Um, Vicky Graves was coming home from work one day. Rob was on the roof uh, doing some, some work on it. And uh, Vicky's just standing there looking at the, the back of the house into the woods and she saw a trespasser. Now, um, it's one of the things that they, they used to have issues with would be people that would, you know, come off the hiking trails and, and trespass on the property because of its reputation. And it was a young man in a red t-shirt and she was just about to get Rob to go down and challenge him when she noticed that this young man's legs kind of weren't there. Um, just below his waist, his legs ended. He seemed to be walking literally in thin air. And as she watched, he walked into the woods and disappeared, you know, which is, which is remarkable. Um, Joe, the lodger moved into the uh, in-laws apartments, which, Really, it's, it's just a set of uh, extra living space that's bolted onto the side of the main farmhouse. And uh, that's what Joe rented. Now, Joe began to have these terrible nightmares that he was being chased through the woods outside the farm. He could never see what because he couldn't bring himself in the dream to turn around and look. But he got the sensation that he was running for his life from something. And um, one night, he's walking his dog down the driveway. Fox Hollow has a huge, huge driveway. It's longer than some streets. So he's walking his dog to the end of the driveway when, when all of a sudden his dog takes off, goes running into the woods. So Joe goes after it thinking, you know, it's a rabbit, it's a squirrel, it's a raccoon, something the dog has gone after. And as he gets into the tree line, Joe sees this guy, this young man, um, in a red T-shirt looking back at him. And then all of a sudden the young man is not there anymore. He disappears. Now, they didn't compare notes. Joe and Vicky didn't compare notes until one night um, – they're looking at some old video news footage because Rob had gotten videotapes of the news coverage of the, of the Baumeister murders. And they're just going through reviewing some of this footage and the, the video footage was showing the faces of her Baumeister's victims. And at the same moment, both um, Vicky and Joe are out of their chair pointing at the screen saying, that's the guy. That's the guy we saw in the woods. And they both had seen the same young man in the woods um, outside Fox Hollow Farm, and his description was almost identical to that of one of her Baumeister's victims. Man, that must have been terrifying for the both of them. Yeah, and, and my theory about why this, this kind of kicked into high gear when Joe LeBlanc moved in is that Joe was a young single guy about the same age as most of Herb's victims were. Mm in his 20s, you know, so I think his moving in was the catalyst. Uh, before then, there had been odd things, like Vicky would vacuum downstairs in the area of the pool, and she would have the power flex of the, the vacuum cleaner yanked out of the wall. Not pulled out, but yanked forcefully out of the wall. That happened more than once, as if, as if something was being disturbed, you know, and one of the creepiest things, I think, was that Rob, um, who worked for a car dealership, had a, uh, a coroner, uh, excuse me, was also a coroner, had a colleague come over to visit him at Fox Hollow one day, and the colleague brought his young daughter with him. Now, you don't mention this kind of thing around young children, right? You just right. don't. So he's given him the tour, you know, talking in very low, hushed voices, uh, and uh, they go into the pool, and of course, kids love pools, right? So this, this young girl's super happy. She's walking around the pool, and she stopped in the doorway to the pump room. Now, the pump room uh, is cold cement so um it's, it's been theorized that before he took the bodies um, of the deceased victims out to the woods her probably laid them out in there until he was ready to get rid of them and uh the the young girl shushed rob and her dad and she's quiet daddy 
that the, the man's trying to sleep in there. And that's it. They upped and left. Uh -huh. um, and this, this kid had no idea of the history. Of the, how could she have known? Right. right. So, you know, vivid imagination, but that would be quite a coincidence, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah. Um, in, your, in your book description, you mentioned that they actually pulled some EVPs from this even. I did. I did personally. Oh, you did? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I moved into Fox Hollow on a couple of occasions. Rob, I told Rob that I would love to research the case and write about it. And to be honest with you, I was in two minds about whether to do a book about Fox Hollow. The main reason that I, that I was cautious was that I did not want to upset any of the loved ones of the men that died there. Right. But as I delved into it, I found that most of them were either completely disowned by their families or had no families. Herb targeted um, his victims with that in mind. Right. And, 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 and probably the saddest thing of all, I think, is that even to this day, many of them have never been identified. You know, wow. the, the, the bodies are actually um, yeah. in storage. They're in evidence storage. They remain. So you look at all these poor young men who died under these horrific circumstances and were never given any kind of burial. They never had any kind of closure in their life. Um, and I didn't want to tear open any wounds for family members, but when I learned that, that really a lot of the families either weren't engaged or, or didn't even know, I decided I wanted to go ahead and research it. And I asked Rob, essentially, to let me move in with a small team of investigators. And, and to his absolute credit, Rob never said, sure, that'll be 500 bucks a night or anything like that. He opened his home to me and he said, research the way you do research and um if you find something great you know if, if there's a story by all means tell it but, but but tell it truthfully that's all i ask of you so we had strange things happen from our very first night at fox hollow um and it's an interesting kind of place i would love to take somebody there someday that had no idea what had happened to the house to tell me if they feel or sense anything amiss about it because i don't think i could live there if you gave that place to me for free, a multi-million dollar house, I don't think I could live there. You know, I'd think twice, honestly, about house sitting for them. <laughs> um, because there's just something about that place, you know. I think it's got some kind of a, uh, an emotional psychic scar or whatever because of the trauma that took place there. But um, we got a number of EVPs. I got into the pool. I'd seen the episode of the show Ghost Adventures where, where they had gone to Fox Hollow Farm, and it, it kind of surprised me that they had never gotten into the pool. And my thought is, when in my career am I ever going to investigate a haunted swimming pool? Oh, I think, yeah. <laughs> I've done two question. so far. Yeah, I've done two. And one of them it's like work and vacation at the same time. Right. So <laughs> we, we were there in November, though. <laughs> and so I, I, I break out, I get into my swimming trunks, and the, the water is so cold, it's freezing. And Rob said, oh, yeah. I said, you know, it costs us about $800 a month to heat the pool. And I like you, Richard, but not that much. <laughs> so if you want to get in, you're basically going to have to suck it up. So I did. And it, oh, it was freezing. Just telling you now brings back how cold it was. But we, um, we set up our equipment. We set up EVP recorders around the room, digital voice recorders. And um, one of my colleagues was growled at while he was swimming in the pool. Uh, which was pretty interesting. But the one that creeped me out the most, we heard absolutely nothing at the time. I was just swimming quietly around the pool, lights out, very, very eerie. No, nothing really amiss, you know? All I could hear was my teeth chattering. But when we played the audio back, you very, very clearly hear a, a male voice whisper the name Laura. And if your um, viewers, listeners would like to um, hear this, it's on my YouTube channel. Richard Estep is my YouTube channel. Um, it, it whispers the name Laura. Now, that's my wife's name. Uh, ooh. And my wife at the time was like a thousand miles away in Colorado. Um, she wasn't with us, but there is no Laura connected with Fox Hollow Farm. Um, certainly no women uh, were murdered there. So um, I, I took that to be almost a, almost a personal, you know, um, implied threat if you will very right. very creepy yeah um, man but it wasn't the only evp we got and, and again another one that you can hear on my youtube channel um we went out into the woods at one of the two um body disposal sites and um 
we brought in a number of, of mediums. Or I like to bring in self-professed psychics that have a good reputation, and I like to, to just, you know, show me what you've got. I'll keep an open mind, and, and some of them produce results, results and many of them don't. But I do at least feel like it's worth, you know, attempting to, to see what they can give us. So one of them led us to the, to the uh, burn pile and said, I have a strong suspicion there are still human remains here um, that have yet to be discovered. And so when he left, I, I went over to Rob and I said, Rob, you have a Walmart nearby? And he said, yeah. I said, well, they have a gardening section. What time do they close? So we went and we bought out pick, shovel, you know, a digging equipment. And um, the following day, we went and dug in that location. And I thought, if we find remains, we're going to have to stop everything and we're going to have to contact um, the authorities. That would be the right thing to do. But I couldn't leave that hanging. You know, if there was something there to be discovered, I couldn't leave it hanging in good conscience. Now, we, we left digital voice recorders running as we dug. Uh, and, and fortunately, we found nothing out of the ordinary. No bones, no remains. But shortly after we'd begun digging, you hear on the audio very plainly a male voice, and it sounds strangulated, very hoarse and raspy, and it says the words, get away from there. Mm. <clears throat> Man. Yeah, EVPs are something that I find to be just, um, you know, I'm, I'm generally healthy skeptic about everything, but EVPs I, I always find just really creepy when they come through, you know, especially when they tie into what's going on and, you know, get away from there. You know, maybe that was a place where the bones were recovered already from, but mm -hmm. the residuals are still there or something like that. Or somebody didn't yeah. want something discovered. Yeah. You know, and this comes down to a lot of the question of what haunts Fox Hollow Farm. And I say what rather than who, because there are a number of theories. Um, I don't like the thought that any of the victims may still be there um, purely because those poor boys suffered enough. And I, I really hope they've moved on to, to some kind of peace to whatever comes next. Um, the, the, the idea that Herb Baumeister himself haunts the farm has been floated by a lot of people. Ghost adventures went with that angle, which, you know, color me shocked, right? Um, the idea of the spirit of a serial killer haunting his old, old house. Now, it's possible, sure, but um, two of the mediums, independently of one another that I, I had involved, both told me that something non-human um, yeah. is involved in the pool area especially, and that it was drawn there because of all the negative energy that, that arose from the murders. Um, and I'm not one of those uh, researchers that sees demons everywhere, you know? I think that's a very overused term and a very loaded term, to say the least. Um, but I am open to the possibility of there being such a thing as a non-human entity. Um, and they've said, yeah, that this, this, this thing is drawn to the area of the pool. It's negative. And um, it, it's kind of like a, a parasite that was drawn to Fox Hollow because of the, the emotional trauma and is feeding from that. Mm. And, all, and uh, they also said it likes to imitate Herbert Baumeister. It likes to pretend to be him. And I didn't tell you the creepiest thing that happened to me. I will never forget this. Um, as long as I live, we were doing an EVP session in the pump room of the pool. And uh, one of my fellow investigators, the only female on the team on this particular trip, had gotten poked in the back, um, about mid-level in the center of her back. She insisted it was a finger that jabbed her in the back. Uh, and, and to me, that kind of stuff is always subjective, right? You're never going to be able to prove it actually happened. Uh, but I'm telling you that I felt just a couple of moments later, fingertips caressing my tricep. It was the creepiest thing I think has ever happened to me in my entire life. It wow. was, you know, I would rather have gotten slapped, bit, or scratched. This was the kind of thing a creeper would do to you. And, and right. it made my blood run cold. I can still... Yeah, that, that was the most unpleasant thing that happened to me on that investigation. Wow. Yeah, it's like part of me, part of me like finds it like terrifying, you know, part of me is all, oh, hell no, you know, but the other part of me thinks it's like the coolest thing ever, you know, because it's totally interesting. Um, in the case of horror, I mean, horror, uh, serial killers, a lot of the time we know them exhibiting stuff when they were younger. Did we know anything mm -hmm. about 
uh, Herb's youth or his his earlier life? I mean, was were there any clues that maybe his parents or somebody else would have noticed? Yeah, we always look for the bed wetting, right? We always look for the the propensity to harm animals, torture animals, kill yeah. animals. Um, what Herb, Herb was known as Weird Herb was his nickname. Great. So there's clue number one. <laughs> um, but he, he was actually placed into a uh, mental institution by his father for reasons that were sealed. Records were sealed because he was a minor. Uh, so he was institutionalized as, as a youth. Um, as he got older, he did things that were just plain crazy. I mean, like a good example was that he was working, I believe, at the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, and uh, urinated on a letter on his boss's desk. Um, uh, so it had these records of just, you know, just, just strange. I'm sure he had an excellent reason. Yeah. Have you been <laughs> to the DMV? <laughs> I mean, that's a fair point. But yeah, so, so there, were the, there were those quirks, and, and I don't know exactly why he was institutionalized. Um, he was also um, someone that those that knew him all said the same thing. They said, you know, oh, he was, uh, he was a nice guy, but strange. He would give you the shirt off of his back, and he was completely non-confrontational. Um, they said that if you had cross words with him, if you um, spoke loudly, if you disagreed with him, rather than argue with you, he would he would lower his head and leave the room. Be very kind of submissive. Um, so you know, he was a very quiet, kind of mild mannered man on the outside. But we know from from those that got on the wrong side of him that he could be prone to fits of explosive rage as well. Just didn't do it publicly, didn't do it with a crowd. Now, you say he was never tried, of course. Sometimes they do try to try these things after somebody dies. And um, Is there any possibility that he didn't do these things or didn't do them alone? There, there's always the possibility that there was an accomplice. Um, and I've heard that theory floated by a number of people. And I couldn't say enough either way to be definitive. Um, I know that um, at least one of the serial killer, a guy called Larry Isla, um, was r- rumored to have crossed paths with Herb at some point. They were, they were both killing in the same area around the same time. Um, Larry Isla died in jail before he could be um, executed for his crimes. Uh, but my, my suspicion on this is that Herb Baumeister was, was acting alone and was doing it through a, for personal gratification, personal compulsion. Right. You know? yeah. right. yeah, that's definitely um, my take from the story. But uh, seeing how he was never tried, you know, I mm-hmm. had to know if maybe somebody floated something by out there that was... A- it's, I mean, it's totally possible, but the... They don't have another There's suspect no in the frame. Yeah. That, uh, and it was only after they started looking into the I-70 murders that they tied her Baumeister to it. And they looked at the MO again, you know, young men, whether gay or not, um, that, that had been molested and dumped in a, in a sexually pr- kind of posed way. So, and the murders stopped when her Baumeister died. That's something else. Right. You know, serial killers usually stop because they go to jail or because they die. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we're coming up on the end here. Uh, I want to be sure that we can tell people where they can get the book, The Horrors of Fox Hollow Farm, Unraveling the History and Hauntings of a Serial Killer's Home by Richard S. Depp. Where's the best place for them to go buy this? Uh, you can get it in your local bookstore, of course, if it's open at the moment. But uh, you can certainly mm-hmm. order it from Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or any of those retailers also. And, um, and, sorry, go ahead, Karen. Oh, and I was just going to say, you have another upcoming book here on Dark Ground investigating the haunted Monroe house, yes? Yeah, again in Indiana. Um, I'm starting to do a lot of stuff out there. <laughs> the, the Monroe house is, is an interesting location that I first heard about on a TV show called Paranormal Lockdown. Um, and it's this house mm-hmm. that reputedly has a dog history. Uh, and one thing that's for sure is that bones, which turned out to be human, were found in a crawl space beneath the house, and they are as yet unidentified. We don't know who they are. Yeah. So um, I finished my paranormal investigation at the Monroe House last year, and I'm finishing the book now. That should be out in August. All right. All right. We'll and have then to talk to you one, about it then. <laughs> then let's recap the one that's coming out a year out from now. So that book, um, the as yet to be titled Serial Killer Project, 
uh, is by Visible Ink Press and uh, should be out round about now-ish, if not slightly earlier, in 2021. Should come back and talk to you guys when it's released. Hope so, yeah. hope so. And if uh, my vote counts, I'm going to vote for you to title it the as-yet-to-be-named serial killer project. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, it'd be nice uh, if you came back and talked to us about On Dark Ground too, man. Uh, this gotcha. has been really interesting. Yeah, uh, crazy really stuff. Love. We don't, you know, we deal with a lot of paranormal and stuff like that. And every once in a while, we get these ones that are heavily rooted in, in reality. And man, I just find Yeah, we don't talk about like serial that. killers on this show that often. Yeah. Usually when there's just a, well, a so paranormal it's insane. angle. But it's... It's it's weird, you know. I've always been the haunted healthcare guy. Um, I do the show Haunted Hospitals, and I mm -hmm. became known for writing about that because I'm a medical professional. But I had this string of, of, of kind of murder haunting cases. So um, I wrote a book called Gacy's Ghost about the, the the spirit of John Wayne Gacy haunting a movie theater in um, right. a small town in Auburn, Illinois. Um, I've done that. I'm writing a book out later this year about the Villisca Axe Murder House and my investigation of that particular haunting. And uh, then there was Fox Hollow. So it's just been a run of, of, you know, a Venn diagram of where the paranormal meets true crime. Yeah. Yeah. Really well, it's fascinating stuff. My wife keeps hoping for me to find a haunted beach somewhere, but it's yet <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> the swimming pool might be the best. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, tell her you know one with a swimming pool. All right, you've been listening to Richard Estep here on Radio Wasteland talking about his book, The Horrors of Fox Hollow Farm, Unraveling the History and Hauntings of its Serial Killer's Home. You can find that in your local bookstore or online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you know, all those places. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me.